On the 26th of May 1948, South Africa went to the polls, and it's not an understatement to say that this election was a turning point in South African history. The reunited National Party outed the incumbent United Party by a slim margin, despite actually receiving fewer votes than their opponents. But through the quirks of first past the post, and with the support of the Africana Party, formed a new government. The new government implemented their apartheid policy, a system of institutionalised racial segregation that would mark South African history forever. But they also established the Atomic Energy Board to conduct nuclear research, marking the beginnings of South Africa's nuclear ambitions. But really, it would take politics a continent away to accelerate South Africa's progress. On the 8th of December 1953, to the United Nations General Assembly, President Eisenhower delivered his Atoms for Peace speech. In this now famous speech, the President balanced the emerging nuclear brinkmanship with his vision of the atomic future. This speech was part of Operation Candor, a Cold War American public relations campaign or propaganda program depending on your perspective. Domestically, Operation Candor aimed to inform the public about the risks of nuclear war with the Soviets, and persuade the public to support the necessary actions of their government, including nuclear research and weapons buildup. Internationally though, Operation Candor was the Atoms for Peace program. America aimed to convince the world, particularly their European NATO allies, who would be in the immediate firing line of any conflict with the Soviet Union, that they, above all, wanted peace. As part of the Atoms for Peace program, America shared nuclear research reactors and provided fuel for their use with countries around the world that were aligned against the Soviets. South Africa, having the fifth largest reserves of uranium deposits, had been supplying yellow cake uranium to America and the United Kingdom since the end of the Second World War, so it seemed natural that America and South Africa would cooperate under the umbrella of the Atoms for Peace program. In 1957, South Africa signed a 50-year nuclear collaboration agreement with America. This resulted in South Africa taking possession of a nuclear research reactor in 1965, and an accompanying supply of highly enriched uranium to fuel it. The South Africans initially focused their atomic research on peaceful purposes, including the potential use of peaceful nuclear explosives for mining and demolition projects, paralleling America's Project Plowshare. In pursuit of these constructive, peaceful nuclear explosives, the South African scientists collaborated with Israel, who had also been supported in their nuclear research program by the Americans. Over time though, the world became more and more uncomfortable with the apartheid regime. In 1973, the United Nations General Assembly passed Resolution 3068, labelling the apartheid regime a crime against humanity. And with the Cold War raging, an external threat was present too. In 1975, Portugal abandoned its African colonies, leaving communists to fill the power vacuum that remained. South African leaders worried that the Soviet Union was aiming to bring all of Southern Africa under the communist umbrella. Finally, in 1976, when South Africa refused to sign the Non-Proliferation Treaty, America withdrew its support. South Africa had found itself isolated, with an authoritarian government facing the red threat and with large uranium deposits at its disposal. All the ingredients necessary for a secret nuclear weapons program were present. South Africa, though, had already started work on weaponization. Prime Minister John Vosta had given the green light to construct their first nuclear device in 1974. That same year, the Prime Minister also had an infamous meeting with Israeli Minister of Defense Shimon Peres in Geneva. The exact details of the meeting were never disclosed, but some believe that a secret agreement was made, resulting in Israel providing basic technological support in exchange for uranium ore and access to a testing ground. Some level of cooperation though is documented. In 1976, South Africa agreed to exchange 50 tons of uranium ore concentrate for 30 grams of tritium, and a military technology exchange resulted resulted in a modified Israeli Jericho 2 missile in South African hands. But the thing about nuclear test sites is they're big and hard to hide, and South Africa didn't really put much effort into camouflaging its facilities. With their reconnaissance satellites, the Soviets found the Vastrap military base, with what looked like testing facilities, at a remote site in the Kalahari Desert. They passed their findings over to the Americans, and international pressure led to the South African government cancelling a planned test, albeit one without a full nuclear payload, and dismantling the test site. Nevertheless, the UN Security Council still hit back, with an arms embargo against South Africa in November 1977. In 
light of this setback, South Africa settled on an unusual four-point policy of deterrence. South Africa would maintain strategic ambiguity, neither confirming nor denying its possession of the bomb, but if faced with imminent threat, would secretly inform allies such as the United States of their capabilities. Then if assistance was not forthcoming, they would detonate a nuclear device to demonstrate their capabilities. Finally, if all this failed as a deterrent, they would use their nuclear weapons on military targets. South Africa would never actually face imminent threat from the USSR or its neighbours, so never reached phase two. But in 1988, when tensions on the angolian nambian border grew particularly high, South Africa did consider demonstrating their armaments. But earlier than that, on September 22, 1979, an American satellite detected a double flash of light in the Indian Ocean, near the Prince Edward Islands, south of South Africa. The cause of this double flash is officially unknown, and although it is theoretically possible to be a false positive, no single natural phenomena is known to cause such a signal and so it is widely believed to have been an undeclared nuclear test. The prime suspects here, Israel and South Africa, deny any involvement. So let me know who you think is responsible and why in the comments below. Regardless of our suspicions, it seems unlikely that South Africa could have done it alone, as based on the post-apartheid findings of the International Atomic Energy Agency, South Africa didn't have a functioning device of their own until two months after the incident. After this first bomb, South Africa continued development of weapons. By 1982 they had three, a low facile uranium-238 test device, the November 1979 demonstration bomb, and a full weaponized vision. Their four-phase strategy was now ready. At the program's peak, enough highly enriched uranium was being produced to build one or two bombs a year, and by 1989 South Africa was in possession of seven nuclear bombs, with their miniaturized design small enough to fit on their medium-range ballistic missile based off Israel's Jericho 2. But on the 6th of September 1989, South Africa went to the polls again for another turning point. Frederick William de Klerk became president. He was both personally and strategically opposed to South Africa's nuclear arsenal. The Soviet Union, who were once threatening to take control of all of Southern Africa, were beginning to crumble. Anti-communists had won a landslide victory in the 1989 Polish legislative election, and the Berlin Wall would come down soon after. More cynically, the apartheid regime was also coming to an end, leading some to suspect that the government wanted to prevent the transitional government, eventually led by Nelson Mandela, from having control of the weapons. De Klerk naturally denies this was part of his motivation, but in any case, de Klerk ordered the dismantlement of the bombs, and decommissioned or converted all related sites to peaceful purposes, thus making South Africa the first, and so far only, nation to have and then give up its nuclear weapons. To round South Africa's nuclear story out, in September 1991, South Africa signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, agreed to the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement with the International Atomic Energy Agency, and allowed inspections. And de Klerk finally, and officially, informed the South African Parliament that South Africa had developed and dismantled nuclear weapons on March 24, 1993. After apartheid and under Mandela, South Africa would go on to be a champion of non-proliferation, leading to the 1990 Treaty of Penindaba, signed by 47 of Africa's 53 countries at the time, and which declared an African nuclear free zone. This video was made with the help of great people who support the channel on Patreon, like these people with their names on screen. The theme tune is by Richard Jones, and as always, whether by liking, sharing, or just watching, thanks to everyone who supports the channel.